Hello, my name is Dr. Scott Manich, and it's an honor to have Dr. Graham Cole with us today to discuss the topic of postmodernism and worldviews. Dr. Cole comes to us as the author of one of several essays written by top evangelical scholars on hot button issues from a Christian perspective, distributed through the nonprofit ministry of Christ on Campus Initiative. Dr. Graham Cole is Anglican Professor of Divinity at Beeson Divinity School in Birmingham, Alabama. An ordained Anglican minister, Dr. Cole has served in two parishes and has contributed to numerous theological journals, books, and dictionaries. He is the author of He Who Gives Life, The Doctrine of the Holy Spirit, published in 2007, and more recently, God the Peacemaker, How Atonement Brings Shalom, published by InterVarsity Press in 2009. Dr. Cole, it's a privilege to have you with us today. Thank you, Scott. Many people today describe our culture as postmodern. What exactly is postmodernism, and what are we to make of it as Christians? What is postmodernism? I think uh, probably the best way into that, Scott, is to use the principle of contrast. Postmodernism is postmodernism. And I like to sum up modernism, the Enlightenment, looking at the 18th century, in terms of reason rules, okay? But postmodernities become skeptical about the claims of reason. And so it's not so much reason rules, okay, but relativism rules, okay. A much more humble stance. Uh, there was a, another part to your question, Scott. What was that one? Right. Uh, what do we make of it as Christians? Is this good from a Christian perspective or, or perhaps more dangerous from a Christian perspective? It's mixed. Uh, challenging the Enlightenment's uh, imperial understanding of uh, human reason with a capital R, uh, we think that is a, a truly worthwhile thing uh, to prick those pretensions. But the downside is uh, to think that uh, conceptual relativism rules, uh, your idea of truth, my idea of truth, your idea of beauty, my idea of beauty, your idea of goodness, my idea of goodness, it's a matter of opinion. Uh, that, I think, is uh, not helpful at all. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't think I've ever met a postmodern relativist who is a postmodern relativist when they get the wrong change at the ballpark, having ordered a hot dog. Uh, then I find they think there really is objective truth, and they know it, and they want their right change. So it's not consistently livable. For many people, Postmodern ideas have led them into a kind of existential crisis. Is it possible to find true meaning in life? Uh, how would you respond to someone who's struggling with those kinds of questions, meaning and truth in a world that sometimes does seem relative, given the variety of truth claims and the variety of beliefs? Mm, that's another good question, uh, Scott. I can understand the anxiety, because if you just start from yourself, you'll end up just with yourself and then you'll be floating over 60,000 fathoms of water, as Kierkegaard said in the, in the 19th century. And that does create an enormous amount of angst. Uh, is there a meaning to life? Absolutely. But here I, I find uh, an interesting help from the ancient world. Plato wrote a dialogue called the Phaedo, in which a character called Simeas says to Socrates, finding out the truth about things is very hard. So we've got to find uh, the best we can and use it as a raft to sail across the waters, unless there is some word from the gods from beyond. Well, as a Christian, I believe there is that word that's come from beyond. And that is a God who is really there and not silent, who's spoken supremely in Jesus Christ. If I want to know what the meaning of life is, I look at him. And I see that uh, life has a design. The word worldview is one that we often hear both in Christian and non-Christian circles. What exactly is a worldview? Uh, it's an interesting idea. Uh, it was Immanuel Kant in the 18th century who coined the term in a German word called Wittenschang. Um, it's a set of ideas by which you understand the world and your place in it. Um, I distinguish two kinds, Scott. I, I distinguish what I call an existential worldview or a frame of reference which answers questions like, you know, who am I? What is life about? What happens to me when I die? 
from what I call an encyclopedic one, which is a grand project mm. to write the book of knowledge of everything, the very thing that the postmoderns think is uh, pretentious. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a worthy project as long as you're humble about it. Mm. Now, what are some of the different world views in our world today? There are a lot, especially in a pluralist society like our own. Um, I think the best way into this is to distinguish between naturalistic ones and non-naturalistic ones. A uh, naturalistic worldview is uh, this is the only reality there is, the reality we have access to through our senses. Um, materialism would be a good example of a naturalistic worldview. Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, uh, the new atheists would embrace a naturalistic uh, worldview. Non-naturalistic worldviews, this isn't the only world there is. Um, and then you'd have Hinduism, Islam, Christianity. That'd be examples of non-naturalistic worldviews. Hmm. And how can we begin to adjudicate between worldviews? Oh, that, that's the criteriological question, and that's always a really challenging one. Uh, I think as a, a Christian, I'd bring three criteria to bear. Uh, I ask uh, whether the proposals on the table are scriptural, are consistent with what I find in, in uh, revelation from God. Because you see, as a Christian, it's not reason rules okay, or relativism rules okay, but revelation rules okay. Mm. So, as a Christian, um, that's a number one criterion. But a second one is, is it thinkable? Uh, can I s tell the story of the world using this particular set of ideas in a way that isn't self-destructive? Uh, let me give an example of being self-destructive. There is no such thing as truth, except I've just uttered one. And so it uh, destroys itself. So it needs to be consistent. It needs to, be, it needs to have scriptural adequacy, logical adequacy, but also it needs to be livable. You, you need to be able to live as though what you claim to be true is actually true. And it's that uh, livability that uh, some people have, um, uh, you know, a very consistent story, a materialist story to tell. But things happen in their lives. I'll give you an example. A professor of psychology um, I heard about through a friend who was a chaplain in a university who ministered to him. His wife passed away. She had a Christian funeral. She was a, a Christian. And he was grief struck because he really loved his wife. But he kept apologizing to my friend Michael because he said, as a materialist, I know her atoms are just being rearranged. But he couldn't stop the tears. To me, it wasn't livable. So livable, thinkable, and scriptural. One step further. So what makes a worldview distinctively Christian? I think the, the answer to that question lies in where the big ideas come from. And uh, if you're a Christian, the big ideas are derived from revelation, from the scriptural testimony. And I like what a Christian philosopher, Nicholas Vorterstorff, says about such beliefs. He calls them control beliefs. Every view of the world, worldview, has a set of control beliefs that acts like, act like gatekeepers to what counts for knowledge and what doesn't. And for uh, the Christian, those big control beliefs come from the scriptures. I'll give an illustration. Uh, from the Middle Ages, uh, you're an historian, you'll love this, I think. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, the, the great Christian thinker of the Middle Ages, he really liked Aristotle, the Greek philosopher. He called him the philosopher. But Aristotle had an argument that the world has always been. And it was an attractive argument for Aquinas. But Aquinas read in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So the scripture acted as a control belief. So in the end, he couldn't buy Aristotle's argument. So that's how it works in practice. Well, one final question. How does or how should the framework of redemptive history transform our understanding of postmodernism and worldview? Um, well, I'm glad this is a three hour interview. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a, a very deep uh, question. I think in the first instance, it makes us aware afresh that the heart of the Christian message is news, hmm. not views. It's about a person who came and a deed that was done. It's about Christ, it's about his cross, it's about the implications of that coming and that cross for human life and destiny. Um, the views that 
that story imply I do help explain the world in which we live. But in the first instance, what uh, the Christian stance reminds us of is that the heart is a trust in a person, not simply in the explanatory power of a set of ideas. And that's where that notion of a redemptive history, something that actually has happened, mm. upon which your fate, my fate, the fate of the world turns, is absolutely at the core. Dr. Cole, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing helpful insights on this very important topic.